This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 66 Matrimonial Projects. The day following this scene, at the hour the banker usually chose to pay a visit to Madame Danglars on his way to his office, his coupé did not appear. At this time, that is, about half past twelve, Madame Danglars ordered her carriage and went out. Danglars, hidden behind a curtain, watched the departure he had been waiting for. He gave orders that he should be informed as soon as Madame Danglars appeared. But at two o'clock she had not returned. He then called for his horses, drove to the chamber, and inscribed his name to speak against the budget. From twelve to two o'clock, Danglars had remained in his study, unsealing his dispatches, and becoming more and more sad every minute, heaping figure upon figure, and receiving, among other visits, one from Mayor Cavalcanti, who, as stiff and exact as ever, presented himself precisely at the hour named the night before to terminate his business with the banker. On leaving the chamber, Danglars, who had shown violent marks of agitation during the sitting, and been more bitter than ever against the ministry, re-entered his carriage, and told the coachman to drive to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées, number 30. Monte Cristo was at home. Only he was engaged with someone, and begged Danglars to wait for a moment in the drawing-room. While the banker was waiting in the anteroom, the door opened, and a man dressed as an abbé, and doubtless more familiar with the house than he was, came in, and instead of waiting, merely bowed, passed on to the further apartments, and disappeared. A minute after, the door by which the priest had entered reopened, and Monte Cristo appeared. Pardon me, he said, my dear baron, but one of my friends, the Abbe Busoni, whom you perhaps saw pass by, has just arrived in Paris. Not having seen him for a long time, I could not make up my mind to leave him sooner, so I hope this will be sufficient reason for my having made you wait. Nay, said Danglars, it is my fault. I have chosen my visit at a wrong time, and I will retire. Not at all. On the contrary, be seated. But what is the matter with you? You look careworn. Really, you alarm me. Melancholy is a capitalist, like the appearance of a comet, presages some misfortune to the world. I have been in ill luck for several days, said Danglars, and I have heard nothing but bad news. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo. Have you had another fall at the Bourse? No, I am safe for a few days at least. I am only annoyed about a bankrupt of Trieste. Really? Does it happen to be Jacopo Manfredi? Exactly so. Imagine a man who has transacted business with me for I don't know how long, to the amount of 800,000 or 900,000 francs during the year, never a mistake or delay. A fellow who paid like a prince. Well, I was a million in advance with him, and now my fine Jacopo Manfredi suspends payment. Really? It is an unheard of fatality. I draw upon him for 600,000 francs. My bills are returned and paid. I hold bills of exchange signed by him to the value of 400,000 francs, payable at his correspondence in Paris at the end of this month. Today is the 30th. I present them, but my correspondent has disappeared. This, with my Spanish affairs, made a pretty end to the month. Then you really lost by that affair in Spain? Yes, only 700,000 francs out of my cash box, nothing more. Why, how could you make such a mistake, such an old stagger? Oh, it's all my wife's fault. She dreamed Don Carlos had returned to Spain. She believes in dreams. It is magnetism, she says. And when she dreams a thing, it is true to happen, she assures me. On this conviction, I allow her to speculate. She have in her bank and her stockbrokers, she speculated and lost. It is true she speculates with her own money, not mine. Nevertheless, you can understand that when 700,000 francs leave the wife's pocket, 
the husband always find it out but do you mean to say you have not heard of this why the thing has made a tremendous noise yes i heard it spoken of but i did not know the details and then no one can be more ignorant than i am of the affairs in the bourse then you do not speculate i how could i speculate will i already have so much trouble in regulating my income i should be obliged besides my steward to keep a clerk and a boy but touching these spanish affairs i think that the baroness did not dream the whole of the don carlos matter the papers said something about it did they not then you believe the papers ay not the least in the world only i fancied that the honest messenger was an exception to the rule and that it only announced telegraphic dispatches well that's what puzzles me replied Dongla. the news of the return of don carlo was brought by telegraph so that said monte cristo you have lost nearly one million seven hundred thousand francs this month not nearly indeed that is exactly my loss diable said monte cristo compassionately it is a hard blow for a third-rate fortune third-rate said danglars rather humble what do you mean by that certainly continued monte cristo i make three assortments of fortune first-rate second-rate and third-rate fortunes i call those first-rate which are composed of treasures one possesses under one's hand such as mines lands and funded property in such states as france austria and england provided these treasures and property form a total of about a hundred millions i call those second-rate fortunes that are gained by manufacturing enterprises joint stock companies vice royalties and principalities not drawing more than one million five hundred thousand francs the whole forming a capital of about fifty millions finally i call those third-rate fortunes which are composed of a fluctuating capital dependent upon the will of others or upon changes which a bankruptcy involves or a false telegram shakes such as banks speculations of the day in fact all operations under the influence of greater or less mischances the whole bringing in real or fictitious capital of about fifteen millions i think this is about your position is it not confound it yes replied danglars the result then of six more such months as this would be to reduce the third-rate house to despair oh said danglars becoming very pale how you are right running on let us imagine seven such months continued monte cristo in the same tone tell me have you ever thought that seven times one million seven hundred thousand francs make nearly twelve millions no you have not well you are right for if you indulged in such reflections you would never risk your principle which is to the speculator what the skin is to civilized men we have our clothes some more splendid than others this is our credit but when a man dies he has only his skin in the same way on retiring from business you have nothing but your real principle of about five or six millions at the most for third-rate fortunes are never more than a fourth of what they appear to be like the locomotive of a railway the size of which is magnified by the smoke and steam surrounding it well out of the five or six millions which form your real capital you have just lost nearly two millions which must of course in the same degree diminish your credit and fictitious fortune to follow out my simile your skin has been opened by bleeding and this if repeated three or four times will cause death so pay attention to it my dear monsieur danglars do you want money do you wish me to lend you some what a bad calculator you are exclaimed danglars calling to his assistance all his philosophy and dissimulation i have made money at the same time by speculations which have succeeded i have made up the loss of blood by nutrition i lost a battle in spain i have been defeated in trieste but my naval army in india will have taken some galleons 
and my Mexican pioneers will have discovered some mine. Very good, very good. But the wound remains, and will reopen at the first loss. No, for I am only embarked in certainties, replied Danglars, with the air of a mountebank sounding his own praises. To involve me, three governments must crumble to dust. Well, such things have been. That there should be a famine. Recollect the seven fat and the seven lean kine. Or that the sea should become dry, as the day of Pharaoh, and even then my vessels would become caravans. So much the better. I congratulate you, my dear Monsieur Danglars, said Monte Cristo. I see I was deceived, and that you belong to the class of second-rate fortunes. I think I may aspire to that honor, said Danglars with a smile, which reminded Monte Cristo of the sickly moons which bad artists are so fond of daubing into their pictures of ruins. But while we are speaking of business, Danglars added, pleased to find an opportunity of changing the subject, tell me, what am I to do for Monsieur Cavalcanti? Give him money if he is recommended to you, and the recommendation seems good. Excellent. He presented himself this morning with a bound of forty thousand francs, payable at sight, on you, signed by Busoni, and returned by you to me, with your endorsement. Of course, I immediately counted him over the forty banknotes. Monte Cristo nodded his head in token of assent. But that is not all, continued Danglars. He has opened an account with my house for his son. May I ask how much he allows the young man? Five thousand francs per month. Sixty thousand francs per year. I thought I was right in believing that Cavalcanti to be a stingy fellow. How can a young man live upon five thousand francs a month? But you understand that if the young man should want a few thousands more, do not advance it. The father will never repay it. You do not know these ultramontane millionaires. They are regular misers. And by whom were they recommended to you? Oh, by the house of Fenzi, one of the best in Florence. I do not mean to say you will lose, but nevertheless, mind you hold to the terms of the agreement. Would you not trust the Cavalcanti? I? Oh, I would advance six millions on his signature. I was only speaking in reference to the second-rate fortunes we were mentioning just now. And with all this, how unassuming he is! I should never have taken him for anything more than a mere mayor. And you would have flattered him, for certainly, as you say, he has no manner. The first time I saw him... He appeared to me like an old lieutenant who had grown mildly under his epaulets. But all the Italians are the same. They are like all Jews when they are not glittering in oriental splendor. The young man is better, said Danglars. Yes, a little nervous perhaps, but upon the whole he appeared tolerable. I was uneasy about him. Why? "'because you met him at my house, "'just after his introduction into the world, as they told me. "'He has been travelling with a very severe tutor, "'and had never been to Paris before. "'Ah, uh, I believe noblemen marry amongst themselves. "'Do they not?' asked Tongla carelessly. "'They like to unite their fortunes.' "'It is usual, certainly. "'But Cavalcanti is an original who does nothing like other people.' I cannot help thinking that he had brought his son to France to choose a wife. Do you think so? I am sure of it. And you have heard his fortune mentioned? Nothing else was talked of. Only some said he was worth millions, and others that he did not possess a farting. And what is your opinion? I owe not to influence you, because it is only my own personal impression— well, and it is that? My opinion is that all these old podestas, these ancient condottieri, for the Cavalcanti have commanded armies and governed provinces, my opinion, I say, is that they have buried their millions in corners, the secret of which they have transmitted only to their eldest sons, 
who have done the same from generation to generation and the proof of this is seen in their yellow and dry appearance like the florins of the republic which from being constantly gazed upon have become reflected in them certainly said danglars and this is further supported by the fact of their not possessing an inch of land very little at least i know of none which cavalcanti possesses except in his palace in lucha ah he has a palace said danglars laughing come that is something yes and more than that he lets it to the minister of finance while he lives in the simple house oh as i told you before i think the old fellow is very close come you do not flatter him i scarcely know him i think i have seen him three times in my life all i know relating to him is through busoni and himself he was telling me this morning that tired of letting his property lie dormant in italy which is a dead nation he wished to find the method either in france or england of multiplying his millions what to remember that though i place great confidence in busoni i am not responsible for this never mind accept my thanks for the client you have sent me it is a fine name to inscribe on my ledgers and my cashier was quite proud of it when i explained to him who the cavalcanti were by the way this is merely a simple question when this sort of people marry their sons do they give them any fortune ah that depends upon circumstances i know an italian prince rich as a gold mine one of the noblest families in tuscany who when his sons married according to his wish gave them millions and when they married against his consent merely allowed them thirty crowns a month should andre marry according to his father's views he will perhaps give him one two or three millions for example supposing it were the daughter of a banker he might take an interest in the house of the father-in-law of his son then again if he dislikes his choice the mayor takes the key double locks his coffer and master andrea would be obliged to live like the sons of a parisian family by shuffling cards or rattling the dice oh that boy will find out some bavarian or peruvian princess he will want a crown and an immense fortune no these grand lords of the other side of the alps frequently marry into plain families like jupiter they like to cross the race but do you wish to marry andrea my dear monsieur danglars that you are asking so many questions ma foi said danglars it would not be a bad speculation i fancy and you know i am a speculator you are not thinking of mademoiselle danglars i hope you would not like poor andrea to have his throat cut by albert albert repeated danglars shrugging his shoulders ah well he would care very little about it i think but he is betrothed to your daughter i believe well monsieur de morcer and i have talked about this marriage but madame de morcer and albert you do not mean to say that it would not be a good match indeed i imagine that mademoiselle danglars is as good as monsieur de morcer mademoiselle danglars fortune would be great no doubt especially if the telegraph should not make any more mistakes oh i do not mean her fortune only but tell me what why did you not invite monsieur and madame de morcer to your dinner i did so but he excused himself on account of madame de morcer being obliged to go to dieppe for the benefit of sea air yes yes <laughs> said danglars laughing it would do her a great deal of good why so because it is the air she always breathed in her youth monte cristo took no notice of this ill-natured remark but still if albert is not so rich as mademoiselle danglars said the count you must allow that he has a fine name so he has but i like mine as well certainly your name is popular and does honour to the title they have adorned it with but you are too intelligent not to know 
that according to a prejudice too firmly rooted to be exterminated, a nobility which dates back five centuries is worth more than one that can only recon twenty years. And for this very reason, said Danglars with a smile, which he tried to make sardonic, I prefer Monsieur Andrea Cavalcanti to Monsieur Albert de Morcer. Still, I should not think de Morcer would yield to the Cavalcanti. De Morcer, stay, my dear Count, said Danglars. You are a man of the world, are you not? I think so. And you understand heraldry? A little. Well, look at my coat of arms. It is worth more than Morcer's. Why so? Because, though I am not a baron by birth, my real name is, at least, Danglars. Well, what then? While his name is not Morcer. How? Not Morcer? Not the least in the world. Go on. I have been made a baron, so that I actually am one. He made himself a count, so that he is not one at all. Impossible! Listen, my dear Count, Monsieur de Morcer has been my friend, or rather my acquaintance, during the last thirty years. You know I have made the most of my arms, though I never forgot my origin. A proof of great humility, or great pride, said Monte Cristo. Well, when I was a clerk, Morcer was a mere fisherman. And then he was called Fernand. Only Fernand? Fernand Mondigo. You are sure? Pardieu, I have bought enough fish of him to know his name. Then why did you think of giving your daughter to him? Because Fernand and Danglars, being both parvenus, both having become noble, both rich, are about equal in worth, excepting that there have been certain things mentioned of him that were never said of me. What? Oh, nothing. Ah, yes. What you tell me recalled to mind something about the name of Fernand Mondego. I have heard that name in Greece. In conjecture with the affairs of Ali Pasha? Exactly so. This is the mystery, said Danglars. I acknowledge I would have given anything to find it out. It would be very easy if you much wished it. How so? Probably you have some correspondent in Greece. I should think so. At Yanina? Everywhere. Well, write to your correspondent in Yanina, and ask him what part was played by a Frenchman named Fernand Mondego in the catastrophe of Ali Tepelini. You are right, exclaimed Danglars, rising quickly. I will write today. Do so. I will. And if you should hear of anything very scandalous, I will communicate it to you. You will oblige me. Danglars rushed out of the room and made but one leap into his coupe. End of chapter 66